We are so excited to announce our new online community platform through Circle. This will be a fantastic place for everyone to receive prayer and encouragement, find out information about serving opportunities, experience the weekend service online as a community, and engage in discipleship courses. Joining our community on the Circle platform is easy. On your phone or computer, go to springcreekchurch.org and click Visit Us Online. This will take you to our community within Circle. Click Sign Up in the top right corner of the browser. Sign up using your email address or use the single sign-on options for either Twitter or Facebook. Once you sign up, it will take you to the lobby section of Circle. From here, you can explore everything we have to offer, from groups to discussion boards to discipleship courses. We can't wait to connect with you there. Welcome to Spring Creek Online. I am so glad you're joining us today. This is a special day for moms across our country. If you still have your mom with you, I hope you can reach out and celebrate her and thank her for influence in your life. If you if you don't, I know this will be a day that's somewhat bittersweet, but you know what? Their legacy of love lives on in us. So we are appreciative of all of our moms, and we're appreciative that we have a day in our country that we set aside just to celebrate you. Well, we are in a series that we're talking about stuff we don't want to talk about, but probably should. In this series so far, we've talked about suicide. Last week, we talked about regret. Today, we're going to be talking about cancer. As we get started, let's pray. Father, I come to you just acutely aware of the fact that every time we gather, whether we're in person or online, when we gather, that you are in our midst and you are up to something special. And I don't know ultimately who is going to be present on the morning when we gather together online or who later will join us from any place around the world. But I pray, God, that this message will transcend this moment, that, Lord, you will truly empower the things I want to share so that they would be encouragement to the discouraged and hope to those who've lost all hope. I pray, Father, for all of us who who have known and loved people who are doing battle with cancer, God, that we would learn how to be a real help. What are the things we can say? What are the things we shouldn't say? I pray, Father, that you would show us, even in the midst of faith struggles, what you have to say to us that puts our heart at ease. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, perhaps no other word in the English language is as loaded as the word cancer. When we hear cancer, we immediately associate it with other words like pain and suffering, disfigurement, and even death. Cancer also immerses us into a whole new vocabulary of words like oncology and metastasize and sarcoma and carcinoma and chemotherapy. If it all sounds like Greek to you, it's because half of those words are Greek words and the other half are Latin. But it adds up to one big foreign language that you're going to have to get familiar with if you or someone you love is going through this. The earliest cancerous growth in humans were found in Egyptian and Peruvian mummies dating back to 1500 BC. The oldest scientifically documented case of disseminated cancer was that of a 40 to 50 year old king who lived in southern Siberia 2700 years ago. Hippocrates, who's considered to be the father of modern medicine, is the reason we call this disease cancer. He was born back in 460 B.C. He died around 360 B.C., and what he called it was carcinoma. That's the Greek word for crab. While it's debated precisely as to why this disease was named after the crab, a lot of people think it's because of the finger-like projections from cancer that remind them of how a crab grabs onto things. Others say it's because many cancerous tumors are hard, like the shell of a crab. Regardless of the reason, the name stuck. It's important to keep in mind, cancer is not one disease, it's hundreds of diseases. Dr. Joyce Ohm with the Department of Cancer Genetics and Genomics at Roswell Park says this, cancer is as individual as the person who has it. 
And that's because cancer is as unique as our DNA. In fact, it's a corruption of it. Cancer is a genetic mutation of our DNA that becomes so mutated that eventually the DNA of the tumor ends up being completely different from the DNA of the patient. To make matters worse, many tumors contain more than one type of cancer cell. So one type of cancer cell may respond well to treatment and other types can escape unharmed and continue to grow. So to get around this problem, different types of therapies are often combined to hit the tumor in a variety of ways in order to rid the body of all the various mutations. Now, the good news is this. There are new discoveries and new treatments being discovered all the time so that medicine today has a bigger toolbox than ever before, which means there's always hope. Dr. Ohm says this, we beat cancer here every day. Every day, patients survive who would not have survived even five years ago. Every day, patients are being cured with new advances that are coming along the line. Someone once said, cancer is not a death sentence. It's an illness. So just how prevalent is the occurrence of cancer? Well, statistics tell us one out of three people listening to me right now will be diagnosed with some type of cancer in their lifetime. The implication being most every family will have an immediate family member who gets cancer. That's huge. And that's why we have to talk about it. So let's get started with the big C and what it brings. When a person is diagnosed with cancer, they're immediately tossed into the ring, not only to do battle with this disease, but also four other large scale issues. Now, the four things I'm going to mention aren't the only issues you're going to face, but these are without a doubt the most common. It's important to talk about them or else we potentially will be caught off guard. If we're not aware of them uh, when we, before we face them, they can compound whatever losses and grief we're already dealing with, causing you to lose heart and even lose focus in your fight against this disease. So the first factor I want to talk to you about is the loss of friends. The truth is, a lot of people get uneasy if you have a problem that hangs around longer than a day or a week. People don't know what to do or what to say when the wheels fall off your life. And the sad truth is, when people don't know what to do or say, they often choose avoidance. Being around people with chronic illness or pain makes them feel vulnerable. You're a reminder that life can be unpredictable, and if it can happen to you, then it can happen to anybody, including them. Human beings tend to avoid what we don't want to face, which is a reminder, once again, of why this series is so important. We don't want to talk about these things, but not talking about them is the problem. One of the first things a cancer patient is most likely to feel is alienation. Many times they feel cut off from other people. They're immediately plunged into an impersonal world full of steel machines and plastic tubes and endless light. This is why it's so important, no matter what you're dealing with, you, you've got to get support, to, to, to find your tribe, to find people who understand and can relate to what you're going through. One of the most popular quotes on Pinterest says this, when you find people who not only tolerate your quirks, but cele celebrate them with glad cries of me too, be sure to cherish them because those weirdos are your tribe. So let me offer you a little advice about what to say and what not to say when you have a friend with a serious illness. First, it's vitally important to treat the person the same way you treated them before the diagnosis. Dr. Sheehan Fisher is a psychologist at Northwestern Medicine. He reminds us, treat them as a person with an illness, not an ill person. So here's a couple of helpful things to say. You can start off by saying, I don't know exactly what to say but please know I care and I'm here for you if all you need is just a listening ear. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to be a trained therapist. You're not a doctor. You're not their nurse. Just be a friend and listen well. Listen with the intent to understand, not to correct them or inject your own story onto theirs. Another helpful thing you can ask is, what can I do for you? Or more specifically, do you need help getting to and from doctor appointments? Can I run any errands for you or go to the grocery store for you? What's something I can do that would just relieve a burden that you're feeling right now? Offers of assistance, especially when they're spelled out in terms of what you'd be willing to do, help people say yes to you. Now, there are also some things you should never say. Things like, I know exactly how you feel. No, I promise you, you don't. 
even if you've had the same diagnosis, you don't know exactly how your friend is feeling, so don't pretend that you do. This can make that person feel like their situation is not that big of a deal or cause them to second guess everything they're feeling because they handle it so differently than you did. Everyone is unique. You should also avoid saying things like, you're so brave or you're so strong. I know you think that sounds encouraging and maybe in some cases it is, but telling someone they're brave or strong might pressure them to act differently than the way they're actually feeling. A person that's battling cancer might have strong days and other days not so much, and that's okay. A statement like that puts pressure on them to always respond in a certain way for fear of disappointing others. They're allowed to have bad days. Another thing to avoid saying, I'm sure you'll be fine. You might think you're just trying to make them more hopeful, but that statement promotes a false sense of certainty during a very uncertain time. You don't know the future, and neither do I. A person with a serious diagnosis should be able to experience feelings like fear and uncertainty, even when those feelings are unpleasant. One final thing in terms of advice, don't put them at fault. This is not the time to make the person feel like they're to blame for their illness. For example, if the person has lung cancer and they've smoked most of their life, this is not the time to criticize them for the decision to smoke that might have caused the cancer. Uh, maybe that's true, but think about it. What can they do about it now? Yes, they can change their habits and their lifestyle choices today, but it won't change the reality that they've filled their own body with a carcinogen. Making someone feel guilty for having the disease, even when their lifestyle likely contributed to it, all that really does is heap condemnation on top of whatever it is they happen to be dealing with because they can't go back and change it now. Our presence should never increase the burdens on people, the things that they're carrying. Instead, the Bible says we're to bear one another's burdens. Here's another example of loss, loss of control. Have you ever noticed how people try to control things over which they have absolutely no control? Like bowling. I mean, have you ever watched people and what they do after they let go of the ball? I mean, they talk to it. They threaten it. They, court and they, they uh, contort their body to the right or to the left as if they're trying to have some magical control over that ball that's no longer in their hands. Does it work? No, of course not. Before I let go of the ball, there's some things that, I, that are up to me. I can keep my footwork right. I can bend my knees in the right way. I can aim for the pins and release the ball at the right moment. But once I get to the foul line and release it, my part is over. Well, in the same way, there are some things we can control in life. But after you've done what you can do, we have to learn to let go. People living with cancer have to learn to distinguish between what they can and cannot control. And nothing expresses that any better than the serenity prayer. Alcoholics Anonymous has adopted it and used it for years. But I actually like the full version of the prayer instead of the truncated version that's always quoted. This is what it says. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. Talk, taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is and not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. So that I might be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. A third loss you're likely uh, face in cancer is a loss of certainty. With cancer, everything becomes contingent upon how you're feeling one day to the next. You work if the sickness allows. Even something as simple as getting up in the morning is stipulated by the sickness. What was once predictable is now provisional. When illness steals away your certainty about what any day may hold, you have to come back to what you can know for certain. What can you do? What can you count on? What can you truly control? Dr. Viktor Frankl, he was a Holocaust survival, wrote a great book called Man's Search for Meaning. In it, he said this, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. 
You see, what Frankel taught is that no matter what happens to you in life, you always have the power to choose your own response. So no matter what this disease may take from you, you still have the power of choice. You can still choose your own perspective, your, your attitude, and how you'll respond. You can choose what you're going to focus on. You can choose to believe that God delights in using the weak to confound the wise and that his power is made perfect in our weakness. Your attitude is always your choice. Christine Clifford was a teen when her mom, Mickey, underwent a mastectomy for breast cancer and slipped into a clinical depression. Listen to her describe it. Mom stopped washing her hair, brushing her teeth, shaving her legs. It was as though mom crawled into bed and never came out again. After about a year, my father left my mom and everything in my life changed forever. So for more than 20 years after that, Christine prayed that no matter what happened to her in life, that she'd never experience breast cancer. By her 40th birthday, everything in life was just going great. She was approaching her 20th wedding anniversary. She had two boys, ages 10 and uh, 8 and 10. Uh, she was senior executive vice president of a large international marketing company. But in November 1994, during a routine breast self-examination, Christine found a lump. Long story short, of the four stages of cancer, she was at stage three. A tumor had invaded her chest wall. On New Year's Eve of that year, Christine had a lumpectomy, and the next 10 months were filled with aggressive chemotherapy combined with 33 days of radiation. All the fears of what happened to her mom came rushing back, but Christine was determined to choose a different path from that of her mother. When she and her husband told their boys about her diagnosis and how the treatment would likely cause her hair to fall out, her oldest boy said, cool, mom, now you'll look like Captain Picard on Star Trek. Christine busted out laughing. She then realized that was the first time she'd laughed since her diagnosis. She said this, she said, my family allowed humor to come back into my life and I picked it up and ran with it. Four weeks after her diagnosis, Christine awoke in the middle of the night and began sketching cartoons that illustrated her cancer experiences. At first, she assumed they were just for herself and were ther therapeutic. And then she realized she could send them out as thank yous to friends and to neighbors. So if someone sent flowers, she'd send them a card with a cartoon of a flower delivery man at the door and her son yelling, Mom, more flowers for your breast. And she sent these cartoons to her family and her friends. And then she made a profound discovery. When people hear you have cancer, the reaction is to pull away because they don't know what to say and they don't want to say the wrong thing. So they end up saying nothing. But the humor of my cartoons put people at ease and opened the door to the relationships I so desperately needed. Christine chose her attitude. When you can't control anything else that may be happening in your life or in your body, you have the power to choose how you will respond to what's happening to you. One other reality that many cancer uh, uh, people, people who are dealing with cancer will face is loss of resources. So there's a woman in Mark chapter 5, and she's living with a chronic illness. She's, she's been subjected to abnormal and constant menstrual bleeding for 12 years. In the story, Mark makes this one simple observation. He says she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Sadly, that reality has not changed all that much in 2,000 years. This woman was financially bankrupt, emotionally spent, and physically weak. She's a powerful reminder of how illness can exhaust our resources, our time, our energy, our money can quickly go down the drain in an effort to try to find healing or relief. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but healthcare costs in the U.S. are the number one cause for bankruptcy for American families. And get this, 62% of the 2 million personal bankruptcies filed each year are the result of medical debt. So the vast majority of people filing for bankruptcy these days are doing so because of a hospitalization or a protracted battle with a disease like cancer that wiped them out financially. Now, when you look at those who filed bankruptcy for medical debt, you discover this. 8.9% of these people could not afford to pay anything toward their medical debts. Small percentage. 
11 million ran up high interest credit card debt to pay their medical debts. In other words, they now not only owe the doctor in the hospital, but you, you now add 24% interest rate on top of that. 90% of those who had homes took out a second mortgage on their homes to pay their medical debt. Now, before you go stereotyping these people as being poor and ignorant, the vast majority of these people who file for bankruptcy are middle-class families, two-thirds of them are homeowners, and 60% of them are college graduates, and most of them had some sort of medical insurance. Getting cancer can be a costly thing. At a time when all your other resources are strained to the max, sadly, for far too many families, the financial resources run out on top of everything else they're dealing with. But now I'd like to shift gears for a minute, and I'd like to talk to you about survivor secrets. The first secret that people share who are living with cancer is this. You've got to know how to live in reality. Now, it may seem like it's unnecessary to say that, but the truth is avoidance of reality is the first obstacle many of us will face. Now, when people hear the word acceptance, they think, well, you mean give up or cave in? Uh, no, uh, giving up is not the same as acceptance. Acceptance simply means the recognition that this moment is what it is. That's it. It's not a value judgment. Accepting something doesn't mean we endorse it or approve of it. It just means we recognize this is my reality right now. Acceptance is not a statement about the future. If we accept something is true, that doesn't mean we can't work toward changing it in the future. It's merely a matter of seeing it for what it is. Accepting one's illness is not going to make it go away, nor will it stop you from continuing to pursue treatment in the hopes of improving your health. But what it does is remove an entirely unnecessary layer of suffering that's a result of struggling against what is true. We can't take effective action until we fully accept what is. Once I accept reality, I can work to improve on that reality. But if I don't accept it, I will constantly fight against it and waste my energy in a worthless fight. The second secret that cancer survivors share is keep hope alive. Paul writes in Romans 5, 5, there is a hope that does not disappoint. Hope is without a doubt the world's most powerful medicine. Though science can't measure its effect and no one can absolutely assess its power, most doctors can recall at least one incurable patient who for unknown or unsuspected reasons slid over into the winner's column. Now hear me saying this, there are thousands who fight cancer, pray, work hard, hope and endure, yet don't survive. The last thing I would ever want to imply is that those who lost this fight were somehow inferior to those who survived. I don't know if you read or not this book. It came out years ago called Learned Optimism by Dr. Martin Seligman. Seligman believed and studies have confirmed that hopelessness and pessimism deplete the immune system. So what Dr. Seligman did was study two groups of cancer patients. One group received no therapy to challenge their pessimism or teach them how to be more optimistic, and the other group did. What they discovered is those who received counseling to deliberately change their pessimistic thinking showed dramatic increases in the number of natural killer cells, where there was no change at all in the control group. In fact, there's a whole new branch of medicine today called psychoneuroimmunology, and it studies the relationship between attitude and health. Your attitude plays a key role, not just in life, but especially in how you respond to this disease. I love the way Mary Ann Rodmacher says it. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. You know, if you're looking for some hope and inspiration, let me refer you to the one of the world's oldest, oldest and, and best loved sources of inspiration, the Psalms. Many of these Psalms were written from a viewpoint of suffering and pain. Now, this is not an exhausted list, but I want to share with you eight Psalms that seem to be written from the vantage point of chronic illness and pain. That's Psalm 6, 10, 13, 31, 32, 77, 88, and 119. Write those down, look them up in the message notes, study them later. Here's a third survivor secret. Be proactive, not passive. 
So patients who actively participate in their own recovery rather than just submit to treatment are the ones who are most likely to thrive. I remember one doctor who said the patients who ask the most question and insist on taking the recovery into their own hands may be the most problematic to me, the doctor, but they also happen to be the patients who do better than the others do. When you're proactive, it helps to move, move you from a victim role to that of an overcomer. Now, I don't know if you recognize the name Dr. Bernie Siegel. He's a surgeon specializing in cancer treatment, and he's the author of the book, Love, Medicine, and Miracles. In fact, he has several books like this, another book called Peace, Love, and Healing, and another called How to Live Between Office Visits. I've read these books. They're phenomenal books. So Dr. Siegel had a patient, a woman whose family history was riddled with cancer deaths. Her father and sister had both died from cancer. When she discovered that she also had the same type of cancer as her family, she said to Dr. Siegel, I don't want to die. Of course, the doctor, being very sympathetic, said that he understood that and he would do everything he could. But before he could finish what he was saying, she interrupted him and said, no, doctor, I really don't want to die. And then she added, everybody I know who has gotten this disease has died within three months of diagnosis. And all I've ever learned is how to have cancer and die. I want to learn how to have cancer and live. So Dr. Siegel was so impressed by this woman that he told her that he had a cancer support group that he referred to by the acronym ECAP, which stands for Exceptional Cancer Patients. And he wanted her to join that group, and she did. She also did something else. She put a three-month calendar on her refrigerator with the words, I will make every day precious. Eight years later, that same woman is writing a book how she didn't die from cancer. Dr. Siegel said this, my patients say that being handed a death sentence forced them to learn how to live. I've learned that no matter how much time we think we have, what we do with it is all that matters. So there's one more survivor secret and it's this, find something to live for. Phil Calloway wrote in his book, Making Life Rich Without Any Money, he said this, I had a startling reminder of this last winter when I took my daughter Rachel to the swimming pool one evening. It was 20 below zero outside, so we ended up sitting in the hot tub surrounded by a small children and adults. Rachel said, Dad, can I have $2 for some treats? And, and Dad, Phil said, no. Then his daughter asked, well, can we go out for ice cream after? And Phil told her that they couldn't do it and that he had to get ready and, and head for home. Well, the man sitting beside them, a complete stranger, looked at Phil and whispered, you take her. If you need the money, I'll give it to you. And that's when Phil noticed that the man's eyes were filled with tears. And the stranger said, I'd give just about anything to take my daughter out for ice cream tonight. She died of leukemia three years ago. That night, Phil took his daughter Rachel out for ice cream. Amy Kelbs is a four-time cancer survivor. She ran a marathon four months after her treatment for the third bout. And she said this, I choose to have a positive attitude through this and continue to live a normal, active life. Back in 1984, Greg Anderson's doctors informed him that he had metastatic lung cancer, that he'd only live for another month or two. Anderson said, I refuse to accept this diagnosis. He interviewed people who'd outlived their doctor's predictions. Eventually, Anderson compiled what he learned into the book, Cancer, 50 Essential Things to Do, and that book is his compelling finding that the people who lived the longest decided they had a purpose and a reason for their life to go on living. So you need to ask yourself, why am I here? How can I make a difference? Even if the difference I make is lying in a hospital bed and having conversations with my roommate, the hospital staff, the nurses, and doctors. Invariably, one of the big questions I get asked a lot is this final one, where is God? in all of this. So let me begin with a faith that struggles. You're sitting in your doctor's office. You're waiting for the results of the biopsy. The doctor walks into the room and says, it's cancer and a very aggressive type. I think you maybe have two months tops and that's with chemotherapy. When your pastor shows up, he says, God knows what he's doing. His ways are not our ways. There are no accidents in God's providence. Do you feel comforted by that thought or do you want to punch your pastor in the nose? In fact, I've heard plenty of Christians who've said just that. They'll say things like, 
everything happens for a reason. God will never put on us more than we can bear. Of course, those are just not religious platitudes. They're statements of theology. They're saying in no uncertain terms what that person believes about God. The implication of both of those statements is God gave you cancer, and there must be a reason for it. Besides that being exactly the same thing that Job's friends told him about his suffering, and God rebuked them for saying that, it still doesn't seem to keep people from throwing it out there like that's supposed to be comforting. Another term for this is blueprint theology, and most don't seriously question it until tragedy strikes them. Dr. James Dobson wrote the book, When God Doesn't Make Sense. In it, he talks about a pastor named Jim Conway, whose own daughter developed a cancerous tumor on her leg. He and his wife prayed and prayed, but in the end, the leg had to be amputated. One of the church members came to Conway and said, Pastor, I think God has allowed this to happen because it's brought about a revival in our church. And Conway said, so what's God going to do when the revival passes? Chop off Becky's other leg, then her arm and her other arm? Pastor Conway was adamant, when you start reaching for puny answers like that, it dehumanizes those who suffer and insults God. He also said, I couldn't explain why Becky had to lose her leg, but I knew the answers being given weren't right. My primary beef with blueprint theology is how inconsistent it is with the nature of God. When someone once asked Jesus to show him the Father, Jesus said this, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In essence, Jesus is saying, I'm your picture of God. In knowing Jesus, we know God himself. In seeing Jesus, we see God's heart. There's nowhere else and no one else we need to look to in order to know what God is like. We, shouldn't, we, we should not try to define God outside of Jesus. Christ is the center and everything in life must be viewed in relationship to him. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you have no reason to assume that God is putting cancer and disease and tragedy on people. Instead, you have every reason to believe that God is at work, like Jesus was, to help people and deliver people from those circumstances. Jesus had compassion on suffering people, and he treated them like they were casualties in a war. He expressed God's heart by bringing relief to people's suffering. Jesus was once confronted by a woman who was bent over and was unable to stand up straight. She'd been living with his affliction for 18 years. Jesus offered none of the advice that believers offer today. He, he never said these afflictions were a part of the Father's secret plans. He didn't encourage her to accept her affliction as from the hand of God. Instead, Jesus taught his audience that this infirmity was the work of the enemy who was resisting the will of God. He then demonstrated the Father's will by opposing Satan and miraculously healing the woman. According to Jesus, God's will was to heal this woman, not to afflict her. This is what we find again and again throughout all the Gospels, without exception, when Jesus confronted the crippled, the deaf, the blind, the mute, the diseased, the demon-possessed. He uniformly diagnosed their affliction as something that God did not will. Peter, when he summarized the ministry of Jesus, he said that Jesus went about healing all who were oppressed by the devil. The Bible tells us the central reason that Jesus came to earth was to destroy the works of the devil. Let me tell you something from the heart. I'd hate to have to stand before God one day and give an account for telling people, people who are suffering, that God did that to them, that I would equate the work of the enemy with the work of God. Some defenders of blueprint theology appeal to one episode in the Gospel of John as proof that Jesus saw illness as part of God's plan. It's from John 9. Jesus and his disciples come upon a man who's been born blind. In typical blueprint fashion, his disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples assume that God must be behind this man's blindness. And a surface reading of Jesus' response may sound like Jesus is agreeing with the disciples, but he's not. Let's read the verse. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now, here's what you need to know about this verse from John 9, 1 to 3. In the original Greek, Jesus does not say he was born blind so that. Jesus simply says, let the work of God be revealed in him. 
translators supplied those words because they felt like they were implied in Jesus' answer. But the truth is, there's no reason to make that assumption. Instead, Jesus negated the disciples' question by not answering it at all. In effect, Jesus was saying, you asked who sinned. I'm telling you, that's the wrong question. The only thing that matters is the work of God being revealed in this man right now. Jesus' whole ministry was about demonstrating God's works, so he heals the man. So let's talk about a faith that keeps on walking. John Claypool was a pastor, had a daughter with leukemia. When she went into remission, everyone thought God had healed her miraculously, supernaturally. And on Easter Sunday morning, she had a terrible recurrence. In his book, Tracks of a Fellow Struggler, Claypool relates how for two weeks his daughter was racked with pain. Her eyes were swollen shut. She asked her father, Daddy, did you talk to God about my leukemia? And he said, Yes, dear. We've been praying for you. And she asked, Did you ask him how long the leukemia would last? What did God say? I mean, what do you say? What do you say to your daughter when there's nothing you can do and you're not sure what to say? Emotionally and spiritually, he was spent. A few hours later, his daughter died. The following Sunday, Claypool was back in the pulpit to preach. At his lowest point, Claypool preached the most powerful sermon he'd ever preached in his life. And he chose the passage from Isaiah 40. Here's the passage he spoke from. He, that's God, gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So this is a passage that's written to the Israelites during their time of Babylonian captivity. They would spend nearly two generations in Babylon. They were spiritually and emotionally exhausted. They were feeling confused. They were bitter. They felt abandoned. So Isaiah is writing this to encourage them. As Claypool is sharing from this passage, this is what he said. He said, there are three stages of life. Sometimes we run or we mount up with wings as eagle and fly. We're on top of the world. Sometimes we run and we don't go grow weary. We just go through the routine. Sometimes it's all we can do to walk and not faint. And I need your prayers and encouragement. You know, I pointed this out before, but it's worth mentioning again. Isaiah reverses the natural order in this verse on purpose. The normal progression of human development is to crawl, to walk, to run. Isaiah turns that on its head. He goes from soaring to running to walking. Now, if you've ever been in a Christian bookstore and you've seen this verse on a painting, it's always of an eagle soaring above the ground or above the mountains. In other words, the thing we emphasize is the first thing in the verse when the Bible is actually emphasizing the last thing. Isaiah tells his readers that there are times when God helps us soar on wings like eagles. In other words, God sets us free. He lifts us above our problems. Then there are other times when God helps us run and not grow weary, times when we're given supernatural strength to run a race and never tire, never get bogged down. But God's people were in captivity and would remain there for an entire generation. Those carried off into captivity would die in captivity. They weren't going to soar above this and be set free. Neither were they going to run this race and never tired. It's called the rule of end stress, end stress and it's an important principle in Bible study. Whenever you encounter a list of three things in the Bible, the emphasis is always on the last thing mentioned. That's the rule of end stress. The third thing that's mentioned is the key to understanding the passage. And what does Isaiah say? God is going to help you keep walking and not give up, not faint, not quit, but just keep putting one foot in front of the other. In other words, there's no supernatural means of escape coming. Instead, you're going to be given supernatural strength to endure. And honestly, folks, this is where life is lived for most all of us. The real test of our faith comes not when a person flies or runs, but when he or she plods along without giving up or giving in. A long battle with cancer is best described as just keeping putting one foot in front of the other. You know, some in this room, some who are listening to me right now, you say, God, I'll hang on. I don't feel very triumphant. I'm hurting. I'm suffering lost. I'm confused. And God, to be honest, I'm not hearing your voice all that well. But God, I'm not going to let go. 
I'm just going to keep on walking. So many in churches today have become practically fixated on miracles. But here's the deal. Even miracles don't often lead to great faith. I mean, instead, miracles tend to addict us to miracles. Look at the children of Israel in the Old Testament, or even how they behaved in the time of Jesus in the New Testament. They just keep asking for miracles. That should teach us something. If all you get is a miracle and you don't get Jesus, you didn't get much. You got a consolation prize. But if you get Jesus and never get a miracle, you get everything. Honestly, in all my years of being a Christian, I've never been all that impressed by people who claim miracles all the time. I find most of them to be very shallow Christians. But show me a believer who's walked through hell and back and keeps on walking with Jesus. And that, my friends, is real faith. The greatest victories that I have from day to day, through dark times, through seasons of depression, through times of opposition, through stressful times of transition, is to keep plodding along, to keep heading in the direction that God last pointed my life, to know that I'm not able to understand everything that's happening to me or why, but that God has brought me this far and he hasn't brought me this far to fail me now. I know he's with me and whatever I'm facing, and I know he's with you too. And if you're one of the many that you have been battling cancer for some time and you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, I want you to know from my heart, you're my hero. Let's pray. Father, I ask today that you would truly visit in every heart and life. That God, so many of us, we know people and even have lost people that we dearly love to this terrible disease called cancer. I thank you that we continue to make advancements against this disease, but I know even the fight itself can be so toxic, can take our health so low just to fight against the many mutations that cancer can spin off in our body. I pray, Father, that we would be the kind of friends that would not be presumptive, that we would not assume to know what our friend might need who's going through a battle like this, but that we would be a strong shoulder, a, a good friend, a good ear, someone who's more than willing to do whatever is necessary to help our friend to be able to manage life while they do battle with this disease. God, I pray for all of us that we might come to understand the, 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 the survivor secrets, how important it is not just to accept reality, but to be proactive in our own healing, that, that God, we would take matters into our own hands, that we would ask a lot of questions, that we would insist on knowing as much as we can possibly know, because Lord, when we do that, when we become proactive, we're no longer victims, but we become overcomers. I pray, God, that you would help us to know that even when we're not in charge of how the chemo makes us feel or what the radiation has done to our body or, or how long we have trudged along in this battle, how it's weakened us emotionally and, 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 and even spiritually, that, God, when we're not, we can't control what's happening to us, we can control how we respond to that. So I pray, God, that you would give us hearts that look out to others to say, God, how can I be a blessing? What can I say? How can I be an encouragement? What can I thank you for today? How can I let your light shine through me even when I am most weak? Because God, when I am most weak, you are most strong. And God, I pray for anyone who, who has maybe been subject to, to Christians, well-meaning Christians or pastors who, who often say things that imply that God, you yourself are the author of this disease that somehow you put cancer on them. God, I pray that they might hear the truth and be liberated with the truth, that when we see Jesus, we see God's heart. We see a God who is moving to alleviate suffering, not one who's causing it, not one who's putting disease and suffering on people, but one who comes alongside in a real way as a real friend. And God, for everyone who is in this long protracted battle, much like the children of Israel in the Old Testament, we often pray for deliverance. We pray for the miracle. We pray for supernatural strength to rise above. But God, sometimes, and for most of us, what happens is you give us the power, the strength to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And God, I believe with all of my heart that that's one of the most powerful examples of faith 
we ever see. In fact, at the end of Hebrews, when the writer is concluding this chapter full of miraculous deliverance, he cannot finish the chapter without saying, but there were others who did not get that deliverance, others who did not receive the miracles, others for whom the world was not worthy because they continued to walk with you even in the face of some of life's darkest moments. God, for anyone who is trudging along today, I pray, God, that they would sense your presence, your love, your compassion, your strength to continue moving in the direction you set their feet, knowing, God, that you will be with them every step of the way, and knowing, God, that even without a miracle of deliverance from cancer, we've already received the greatest miracle that anyone can have, and that's the miracle of the cleansing of the sin sickness of the soul. It's that miracle that guarantees all the others because one day, God, we will stand in your presence whole and complete, and none of the things that have caused us problems in this world will have ultimate victory over our life. One day we will be free, one day we will be whole, and one day we will be complete because Jesus is our completer. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're grateful that you would choose this time, whether you're joining us on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock or any other time during the week to be a part of our online congregation. Next week, we wrap up our series talking about the last thing we don't wanna talk about, and that is death itself. After that, I'm gonna do a standalone message about communion that I'm calling, come to the table. I hope you join us in the coming weeks and I pray that this will be a truly blessed week for you all.